thanks Jillian for being with us and over to you. Great. Um, so a lot of this paper really comes from this idea that it's a transformational business idea. I love to go back and to this quote by John McElwain from in his writings on the company saying, you know, with apologies to Hegel, Marx and Lenin, the basic unit of modern society is neither the state nor the commune nor the party. It's the company. And I think for far too long, um, you know, all, now over 150 years, it really has been the company. But when it, the word came out, it was campagna, Latin for breaking bread together. It had a much more community orientation to it. Um, and so, you know, having this transformational business idea that really did allow a lot of productivity and efficiency, and it really came from the structure of it. It came from the law. When I teach my students, I tell them that if you don't have this legal structure, we wouldn't have been able to achieve the scale and trust that we have now. But I think the DAOs are representing this you know, increasingly potentially better option that's very rooted in the technology and the methods of our modern society. And so I don't think we're in a utopia limited anymore. I think we're in a much more um, modern state. And so this is really what led us and also in the academic literature, um, the common view that has probably been for the last 50 years in the legal literature of what a firm is, is really just a nexus of contracts. And so I actually love putting it as a nexus of smart contracts, that this idea, you know, that the firm is really this fictitious stake that has advantages because um, it's not, you know, limited by biology, but it still has agency costs. And so really what you should ideally be doing is focusing on, um, you know, properly writing your contracts. But as we all know, you can't contract on everything. There's always going to be incomplete contracting. You know, you can't know that the pandemic was happening. You can't have every state of the world. And because of that, um, what I really get excited about is smart contracts and the ability to bring in information and dynamically update and to be able to potentially, you know, through their self-executing nature, you know, eliminate a lot of these um, frictions that we have existing in you know, this nexus of contracts that is the traditional firm. And so that's where I really like want to motivate anybody who in the audience who might be a traditional academic to think about it. Um, so what our research question is here is that, yeah, there's been this rapid growth in DAOs and I kept seeing them experiment. It's really cool that they're experimenting with governance in a way that you just can't do um, for big corporations. And it's funny because there's been so many papers written on just like simple changes in your articles of incorporation from state to state or changes in your bylaws from company to companies. Um, and so when I was seeing such variation, I think optimism was really the one when I saw what they were doing, like got me drawn in and was like, okay, I want to write this paper. And so we basically collected a bunch of data and read through white papers and did different things and collected proposals and are looking to try and understand how different features of governance relate to returns. And so just to give you an analogy to the equity literature, a lot of people talk about, you know, not having takeover defenses or maybe not having a staggered board because you want to, you know, make sure that management isn't entrenched. And there's a lot of evidence out there that says better governance is associated with improved uh, equity returns. And so this was what I wanted to say is like, okay, but here we have actually different problems and different challenges. And so I look at some stuff that's traditional, but I also expand beyond that. Okay. So really that's how we sort of got into it. We're going to look at the voting process. We're going to look at the organizational design and we're going to look at security. Those are sort of the three categories that I put things into. And then we have basically 28 features underlying those three categories. And I'll talk through some of them. Um, and ultimately our plan is to analyze the value implications and see which features sort of maybe promote broad participation, you know, promote things like that, if that's related to positive uh, returns or not, okay? So before doing that, part of me also wanted to just know what these DAOs are exactly doing and how much that related to it. So how did we get this data? Um, I will admit we're not, uh, I know Tally now has an API and stuff like that. When I actually first collected it, it was a lot of using boardroom, snapshot, Masari, Dovmetrics, some um, of Discord, doc, various people's just documentation and reading through what they had. Um, you know, I put this as 150 prominent DAOs. Uh, I'm sorry if I did not include yours. I would totally add more to our data. We've actually been working on expanding it to more. And then we roughly did about 10,000 plus governance proposals where I have also read through a lot of the governance proposals and tried to understand exactly what they're doing. I mean, and it is a little mind blowing what they are doing. I'll talk about that a little bit. But so just so you understand our sample, 
Um, the big categories we have are DeFi, basically what I'll call infrastructure, um, building out the ecosystem, and then Web3 DAOs. Um, so we're going to have some of the ones that you'll know, the public good ones, um, you know, a lot of this virtual and augmented work, social clubs, like friends with benefits, stuff like that, but also a ton of them are basically the DeFi ones. You know, it's what you would know. It's so it's uh, Uniswap, it is Compound, it is MakerDAO, it's stuff like that. Um, okay. And so just to give you a sense, it's roughly what I'd say 60% of them are DeFi, but another big chunk is Web3, and then only about 10% of them are infrastructure. And so this is the proposals, and this was my thinking. Um, we haven't put this paper out, but I wanted to help people get a sense of what they are. So in the traditional equity context, what proposals we see are only governance ones, really. You're not allowed to vote on things that I would call traditional management decisions or traditional product decisions, and especially not on finance. Where are you going to invest? What are you going to pay out? Those are never anything that you're allowed to do. And then I was reading all of these proposals, and you're doing a lot more in these areas that are traditionally not allowed to be uh, part of the annual meeting for shareholders. And actually what I thought was even cooler is that you know, reading some of these proposals, it was really about the viability of the protocol in the long term. So I've been trying to think of what is the objective function for a DAO if it's not to maximize returns. Um, and so you have to think about what it is. And I think the objective function really could be maximizing the viability in the long term. And so going through that, that helps me think back through these different categories and what they're doing. Um, so this is the proposals we're looking at. And I will give you that we have dates um, for both when they typically come up in the forum for at least a large subsample, and then um, you know when they would either go to vote on chain or off chain, and then ultimately um, the conclusion of the voting period. So let me talk a little bit about the governance of DAOs. So you know, Governor Bravo is probably one of the most common paradigms. Um, and it sort of helped me start to think about what are these key provisions that uh, I want to think about uh, when going through the proposals and the process of voting. And so I started to think about, are there ownership thresholds to propose? You know, can anybody bring a proposal forward? Can it be a community member or does it have to be a creator? You know, what if they don't know how to code? Are you going to have provide a service for them so that they can have their idea turned into code? What about the risk management there? You know, are you going to actually vet it first in a more risk management perspective, or is it really just people's, you know, few the few people that read it on a forum? You know, is there the uniformity of the information in the proposals? You know, is there an exact the way the SEC wants you to have it going forward? Is there an exact way that the proposal looks? Can members delegate their tokens? If so, you know, what incentives are there to vote? How are votes weighed? You know, is there an option to abstain? How long is the review period? I know there's some people, um, especially that don't love the three-day review period that would rather have it be a week. Maybe they have their regular meetings on Monday night to like, you know, look at whatever the votes they have to do and things like that. Um, and then you can see here, obviously, um, you know, part of the security feature that Governor Bravo has is this time lock before it gets queued and executed. You know, if something were to pass that like somebody pot potentially could override it. And so this has got me a little bit thinking about the security features. Um, and then I also was mentioning optimism where it was just so different, right? Where they were saying, no, we're not doing it on chain. We're gonna do it on snapshot. You know, we're gonna have different types of voting. Um, things have totally different quorums and approval thresholds. We're gonna have different durations. You know, we're gonna have it go all of these different ways. And that really got me thinking like, wow, People are experimenting in ways that I didn't expect. And maybe we'll see one be better than the other. Um, so these are the data that I collected information on given that subsample of um, you know, 150 DAOs that we had. And what I was looking at was the voting mechanism to start. And so a simple quorum um, versus a relative quorum. So a simple quorum is where they require everybody to vote versus a relative quorum, it's whoever actually votes. And then we're taking the 50% out of that. Um, some are relative quorums with differentials, which means that you'll give a little bit, um, you know, it has to be uh, more, that it can't be close if it's only a smaller proportion. Uh, Supermajority voting, about 11% have that. And generally in equity markets, we tend to hate supermajority voting, especially for MA transactions. Um, weighted voting, where 
there can be different ones. I think it's most commonly the reputation, some form of reputation or some form of how much you've staked or something like that gives you um, your weight. We only saw 3% quadratic voting for as much as attention as I feel like quadratic voting actually gets. Um, conviction voting was 1%. Lazy consensus, about 7%. And then voting requirements that vary by content. So sort of more like uh, optimism where it was really what it is, what are you voting about? Um, yeah. And then we started to, yeah. Sorry, if, if, if I can ask you, because I find this super interesting. I didn't know there were, well, like I'm really surprised there is 7% of lazy consensus. Would you have just off the top of your uh, of your mind if uh, a couple of examples of who that might have been? If not, that's okay. I know there is a lot um, of those. I admittedly did this last December and so don't remember in my head, but I can go back and pull up the data um, afterwards if we have time, if you want to sure, like, thank you. look. Uh, yeah. And then we went to sort of the voting process. So where does it start? Um, I mean, the good thing is that a lot of them do start informally. Um, then that is how much is people actually monitoring the informal um, spaces and stuff like that? How much are there requirements to create a formal proposal? So must you hold X tokens, which is typically the requirement, although I've seen some have uh, some slightly different ones. Um, and then sort of this uniform transparent uh, template for proposals, which I think people have gotten a little bit better even over time about that. I've seen changes over the process. Um, you know, requires executable code, sort of what I was mentioning. So, you know, you have no developer to help you if you have an idea. So uh, that can be chart. Gasless vote for signaling. So admittedly, I think it is where I pulled the data from. Um, I think if I would have used tally, it might be a little bit different, but I do have a lot of people who are doing off-chain voting. Um, Quorum requirements. Uh, so typically, for example, 5% of the token supply, most people do have quorum requirements. And then votes can be delegated to individuals or DAOs. Uh, I think that's one interesting idea is like, are you vote, are you delegating to another DAO? Uh, has been a thought I've had about how we could maybe improve some of the delegation. Okay. Um, Okay, and then the last, let me go into this one. So then these are some of the more organizational design features. So I was looking at sub DAOs. I'm mixed on sub DAOs um, and I'll come back to them a little bit later. Um, so I think of them as sort of a way that you're getting more at an entrenchment. And so this is parting, parting to get into where I think of traditional organizations, how we entrench management. Um, so more layers helps entrench. I know there are other people who are big fans that it's like a way to delegate and I will, so I'll go back to that later point. Um, appointed representatives to a board-like council. Um, I saw roughly a third, I would have called them, had a structure that I, seems board-like to me, or at least has something that way. So multi-year token vesting schedule for key members. That's just something where we think that that incentivized continued participation, not just create it and leave it. Um, Incentives to vote, uh, sort of like increased rewards or staking or you know some type of reward there, and then actually this was one that really humors. I, it surprises me. So these are just like the proof of attendance badges, but they actually always seem to come up significant. The people somehow respond to this, and then we look at the security features. And so I'm saying, is there a delay or time lock before implementation? Um, I know multi sigs can be controversial, but a, a multi sig for implementation. You know, can the core or developer team override? So even in some things that are more advanced, I'd say at least a third of ours, we had core developer team could override it. Um, about 17% had these feasibility studies. So how, you know, they looked at it from a security, a financial technical standpoint, and sort of gnosis safe snap um, if people were using it. And then I guess I was also trying to understand who people were modeling after. And I admit that I ended up putting more people into other, I understand there's, uh, different sources out there, but I wasn't seen as much as I would have thought. I saw the most be Governor Bravo and maybe about 6% Aragon. Okay. So now let me talk about, now that you've seen sort of the features and these 28 features we're looking at, how we thought about mapping it um, to prices. Okay. And so when we're doing it, we're looking at crypto adjusted returns uh, on proposal votes. And so when we're looking at proposal votes, we're going from open to close. Okay, I, I'll talk about the robustness of this later. Uh, we think it's actually a really sort of useful and you know, you're actually thinking about a decision. So your expectation is very clear. Um, and crypto adjusted is sort of following the you know, finance literature has grown to say, look, most people in asset pricing do factor models. 
and factor models say you can put a tilt this way or that way. And so what we're doing to adjust is to adjust for sort of the market factor, um, which is primarily looking at the dominant coins. Okay. So when we see these uniform transparent templates, we actually see negative, but otherwise all positive for sort of off-chain gasless voting, for votes that can be delegated, for providing incentives to vote, for doing these proof of attendance badges. So these are all positive. So four out of five coefficients are positive. So this represents abnormal returns because I said they're crypto adjusted on these proposal votes. So this is suggesting, um, you know, that they're, we like things to be inclusive. So these, these would be the ones that I would say, you know, help make it more inclusive, having more people vote. Um, we put in year, country, and doubt type fixed effects. Um, and then we put in controls. And so I, I have the country for almost all DAOs, except for if I don't fully know, I call it decentralized country um, for clarity. Admittedly though, the R squared for stats people there, it's not super high for this, but I, I'll go on and pass that. And so then the restrictive features, you start to see the same pattern from before, but the other direction. So, you know, requirements to create a formal proposal is positive, but the rest of them, you know, executable code, quorum requirements, relative quorum with differential, super majority voting, voting requirements by varied content. What we end up seeing is again, six out of the eight coefficients are negative and statistically significant. Sorry, it's very common in finance to do stars based on 1%, uh, two stars is 5% and three stars is, or sorry, three stars is 1%, two stars is 5% and, and one star is 10%. Um, to think about uh, that and how they're coming out. And so what we're really seeing is the significance of restrictive governance features deterring from returns. Again, these are these proposal adjusted returns. Yeah, uh, Jillian, I have a question about the, the two columns. What's the difference between them or what they represent? Uh, so the difference is just the controls we put in. So sometimes I put in, um, I'm actually a little bit not 100% sure what controls we were putting in, but I had addition. Oh, it's all the stuff that I had about the economics. Remember at the beginning when I was saying, oh, are you a DeFi? If you are a DeFi, what exactly type of DeFi are you? If you were uh, infrastructure, um, this is trying to say like, oh, maybe this is really the returns are coming from the fact that it's not uh, about their governance. It's really coming from a feature of the um, business model itself. And so when we put these additional controls in here, this yes and yes, the fact that the results don't change that much gives me more confidence that it, it is truly coming from these governance features. And then this is the one on security. Um, where we're moving and looking at, um, you know, the multi-sig, the core developer overriding, all of these things. And, you know, this is one that where you might be like, I'm surprised. Like, you know, you might think that like, we want to give more power to the people, but I do think that there's a, a sense where people need trust, right? And to have trust, you need a sense of security, a psychological safety, right? That nothing's going to get ripped off. You're not going to get hacked. And so this is something we revisit too. And so we see a lot of this, the more secure governance features you have, you know, the more positive your uh, returns are. Okay, so this is actually a heat map to see it all together. So a blue means a positive correlation, a red means a negative correlation. And then we sort of put the features um, that were inclusive up here, the restrictive ones here, and the secure ones here. What we're ultimately gonna do is basically, I said, what, inclusive is good, restrictive is bad, secure is good. I'm going to create an index where I add up based on what we think of as good versus bad to see how high of a score you can get. Then we're actually gonna run regressions again now, but with just the index, not with these individual features. Okay, but what you're seeing is, and this is sort of what's true, there isn't a, really, it's pretty noisy. You know, it's not that like every firm or every DAO has, a, has all the restrictive features and then they have all the inclusive ones. There's a lot of noise uh, across it. And in particular, um, you know, not, not everybody is gonna have all of these features right now. And so it does suggest that there's rooms for improvement too. Okay. And so what we end up doing is first, we just aggregate to the three individual components and then put them together. And when we aggregate it together like this, we put them in each individually and we see ah, positive, significant, negative, as we expected, positive, significant, 
And then we put them in all together at the same time. And then this is the final one is adding these additional controls for business model. And so we're seeing it still holds out to be significant in these situations. So it suggests to us, um, much like we think about corporate governance uh, for equity prices, that you know having inclusive but secure features is sort of the new novel ones. Whereas the restrictive voting features, we've always talked about entrenchment of management for a long time. Okay, and I think the value of inclusivity for me personally, I've written a lot about crowd wisdom in the fintech space before. I think it really comes from the crowd wisdom that you're getting, um, but that can be a dual edged sword too. Um, so I'm sure to revisit that idea. What we ultimately then do is actually put them all into the one index. So this is this next slide. So when we put it into the one index, obviously signing the restrictive one the opposite way, you can do the single index split people. It works. And then you're like, oh, is it all driven by the high or the low? So we can see the results for both the low, if you're low on the index and I'm just running on you guys, I get the result versus if I'm just running on the high index guys, although it's a stronger result for the high index guys, which means that they have most of the good governance features or strong governance features. And so, but this pattern, the fact that we're seeing across so many different settings um, is giving us confidence in it, but these are again are related to proposals. So that leads us to our sort of last stuff, stuff we've been working on more, which is to say, okay, now let's think about um, what returns we were using, right? We were using these proposal returns. So we actually try a couple of different things. We look at raw returns, similar pattern. We look at calendar time returns instead. So weekly returns and monthly returns and see a similar pattern. And then finally, for some of them, because there's this sort of this controversy around what's the window, if it really came out on the forum and it's really about expectations of what's gonna happen, you already knew what was happening in the day it was proposed on the forum. And so we do some of them around looking at the forum uh, as opposed to when it actually went to vote. Um, but that makes me think that the results are pretty robust because I can look at it that way. And then the final, some people are like, well, it's always speculation prices anyway. So maybe people are just again, speculating regardless. And so this is where we started to look at the, you know, this is supposedly my picture of a hacker. I'm sorry if I offend, offend people with the picture, but, um, uh, it's this idea that we said, okay, let's look for real effects. And so I have a whole news, um, basically everything in the crypto news, I can pull out hacking news and say, when we have hacking news, does it feel like the people who had these secure features, like how is it looking there? And we're seeing so some evidence of real effects. And so that would suggest that it's not just the speculation, but really it's about this underlying um, effectiveness of the organization. So I will put it, um, so that was the end of the results if anybody had questions, but I'll now put it in the context of equities. and sort of say what I've most learned about this. So some DAOs have already implemented versions of both dividends and buybacks voted on by token holders. So the way we actually think about equity prices is that it's an expectation of payout in the future, discounted, right? Um, the price of a vote is typically not large in the equity context. It's maybe largest when there's a change of control context. And that's what Luigi Zingala said, uh, Chicago Booth had to say. So what is interesting to me is that we're seeing more value here in the voting rights. Um, but that doesn't surprise me in some sense because we're voting on more important issues when we go back to that whole spectrum that I showed you. It's not that we're just voting on governance. We're voting on a whole bunch of different things. And so that is why these voting rights might be more valuable in this context. Okay. Um, and this leads us to sort of the conclusion of this first paper. And this was, sorry, with my co-author, Ian Pell at Virginia. You know, DAOs are an innovative organization. Um, meant to reduce the cost of centralized management by coordinating activities through decentralized governance. And we see that there seems to be different index features that can make your governance um, have more positive value implications. You know, so by combining this large set of things, we've seen that, you know, what proxies for sort of traditional aspects, so these more agency costs, the restrictive ones, versus more novel aspects, like the inclusion and security, um, both seem to matter. Uh, for governance returns. So with that, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how I combine my thinking on governance and culture, and because of culture being something that's really been important in my research. So in particular, uh, I try to put it all into a decentralized framework uh, for effectiveness. So I think that you have both these formal 
institutions, so your rules and procedures, and you have informal institutions. These formal institutions are decentralized governance. It is you know, this inclusive, restrictive, and secure, but it's also centralized management practices. Regardless, you're going to have a developer team. You're going to have some leadership. I recognize that a lot of pay and DAOs is retroactive compensation, but you can think about how the same, I didn't change it from what traditional works are, but the same sort of set of centralized things. Whereas informal, what I really think of informal as being is your culture. And it's about aspirational values. Okay, we all know that, you know, it's not that people say and when CEOs, you know, speak, they're they're trying to inspire you to be better, right? And so it's how close are your day-to-day -day norms or those actions you take with what you aspire to be. So if you aspire to have, you know, a strong ethical foundation. You better be reporting on ethical behavior on a day-to-day -day basis. If you aspire to this innovativeness and adaptability, you better be developing new ideas organically. So it's basically making sure those are aligned. So I think when you bring then the informal part in with this formal part, that ultimately when how they all mix is what determines the effectiveness of your organization. Right? It's this mix of the two types of institutions, the informal and the formal, that will ultimately lead to the creativity, the productivity, the value, the compliance, the ethics, all of those things that you really want uh, as outcomes within an organization. So what is culture? I know I sort of gave you some of these aspirational values and people always seem to struggle with it. I recognize that you know, different people have different assumptions and biases about what's important. Um, what I think is beautiful about culture and why I love it so much is that I do think it is a force to align people on similar values. Um, whether you're old or young or you're you know, black or white, it is very uh, a way to bring everybody together, okay? But it's hard to observe and complex. Uh, you know, other people can't explain it unless you've worked at that firm. Sometimes culture isn't well defined, that you know, the leaders aren't just great at doing it. There's disagreement about what the culture should be. So subcultures emerge. And sometimes there may be agreement about what the culture should be, but there's little emotional intensity about it, right? Okay, we can all agree to it, but it's sort of lip service. And so we don't have those day-to-day -day actions that really reinforce it. We don't have a cheerleader within the firm that isn't bringing that emotional intensity to it. Okay, and so these are some of the things that I thought about a lot on how you can get and improve the culture within firms. Um, this I pulled from executives, um, what they seem to think culture is, just to help people think a little bit more. They think of it as a belief system, a coordination mechanism, an invisible hand, how employees interact with each other, a standard of behavior, norms around how people treat each other, part work ethic, part ambience of the work environment, how the company really works, the operating style, the tone at the top, or what type of company this is. Um, and this comes from a survey we did, uh, this is published now, but we did a survey a few years ago of 1,400 North American executives, of which many were of very large public firms. It was a really wonderful uh, learning experience. So, so I did some interviews with these executives. Also, we did the full long survey and learned a lot about their thoughts on it. Um, and so, you know, what do people say? So this is a word map I pulled from another one. It's typically, this is more in the corporate context. You're about excellence. You're about respect. You're about innovation, teamwork, you know, performance. Uh, it can be a lot of things uh, that they say, but it's usually well described or advertised. But that does not mean it is actually followed in practice. And I think that's the big challenge was, um, I put this up because I, I like to teach Goldman Sachs, or I have to teach finance classes to my kids at school. Um, so words like this came out of the, case against the fabulous fab that the words such as honesty, integrity, and fair dealing do not mean what they say. They do not set standards. They're mere shibboleths. If Goldman's claim of honesty and integrity are simple puffery, um, finance may be in more trouble was part of the judge's response. Uh, and I think that this is a, a big question. I mean, we're seeing this happen with the banks again. You can look at the uh, UBS versus Credit Suisse and they had totally different words in their language. It's there. Okay. Um, and so how do academics actually think about culture? The way we tend to define it is as this informal institution is typified by patterns of behavior, but those are reinforced by people, systems, and events. Okay, it's manifest in many elements, um, and, but it brings unity to the employee's perspective through the expectations they have for how they need to behave to fit in and succeed in their firm. 
Okay, you could call this an organization, you could call this a DAO. So it's what people? Well, it's always gonna be your leaders, your teammates, your customers, your investors. You know, it could be inventors. What systems are reinforcing it? Well, that's, you know, markets, regulation, governance, formal systems, management practices. What events are reinforcing these patterns of behavior? Those can be big societal events, but it's really about learning too. I always tell people that culture is learned. It's learned from how your leaders explain your response, whether it was a failure or a missed market opportunity. You're always learning from these big events, okay? And they're telling you and teaching you exactly what to expect and how to fit in and behave. So what role does culture play? I will just point out from our survey, I love this. We actually had to replicate this on a different thing. And so this stood in two different surveys that we ran. Uh, was that culture was the most important long-term value driver. Execs believe it's the most important. Yet 84% of the execs we had said culture is not where it should be. And they thought that actually improving their culture would increase value. So this is consistent with every single um, employee <laughs> who sort of you know, claims that they're working in a toxic place and doesn't love their work culture. I think sort of where the urge to create DAOs and other things were. Um, and so how can culture be improved? So one of the things I really wanna emphasize is the need for continuous investment. And I think that the little you know, game that we used to play as a kid and pull it out and see it go, and then it slowly, slowly slows down, is a lot of people wait for basically this horrible event or some catalyst where they can make a big investment in culture. They have this new campaign about the big values. They might put it on the elevator, put it on your computer screens as backdrop, all this stuff, but then it fades, right? It fades because there's not continued investment in this change. And I think what I want to really say is that it's more the small things that actually seem to matter in the longer run for sustaining a culture change than it is the big things. It is the knowing that you are removing barriers to a work if that's really what you want to improve is the efficiency. Are you making sure that that's what's going on? Um, are you having meetings that are you know, stand up meetings so you're not wasting as much time in meetings. And I think so, you know, there's a lot of examples I can give or how you're getting feedback for different people of plans, but just want to emphasize that continuous investment matters a lot. I also sometimes put up pictures of cheerleaders in my class. I think having cultural ambassadors and having them at all levels of the organization is sort of a classic, simple way to improve the culture because there are people who care about it and are happy to champion it. And so finding those people and giving them power and voice. Um, other things I wanted to think about is nudges, right? So I worked with this company um, and they do a lot of, you know, the future of your success, get better, work smarter, achieve more. And so through all the data that we have now, um, they're able to really give people nudges or smart suggestions as they like to call it. But what they see is they go through your work patterns and learn about you. Are you wasting your time doing emails in the morning when you should be doing them at night because you know you can email at any time and whereas you know big thoughts and big ideas really need to be first thing in the morning for you and they help you build habits um, by you know learning you and learning your patterns and then helping you change what you're doing but one of the things that i really love about their smart suggestions is they also do ones recognizing that there is a spillover effect if you change a person who is a negative Nancy on the team to being a more positive person, or maybe inviting somebody to do a walk and talk just to share thoughts and sort of become closer, it has really these big ripple um, spillover effects for other workers. And so uh, what they really have been doing is embracing these nudges and sending messages to try and improve the impact to others. And you can really see it from the messages that they're sending, okay? Um, now, this is me getting back to the sub DAOs. So obviously, when you're in a startup phase, it's a lot early, easier. Everybody's aligned, mostly because you're working with the same tools. It's the same code. It's the same resources. You're looking at the same dashboards. It's the same style. But as an organization grows, you know, inevitably, you're going to have people that have went down a different path, maybe bringing in new and different tools. You're expanding in ways. And so I do think that that is actually one of the most beautiful parts about DAOs is how easy it is to create sub-DAOs and how easy it is to um, 
perhaps allow for the thriving that way. And then I think the last thing, and this is where Ian and I have been going with our research for the next set of projects we want to work on, was this improvement proposals are great, but I think decentralizing everything can really backfire. Um, for example, I was reading one proposal, and I still can't believe they voted this way. But the company had, been, or the DAO had finally got um, a prototype very close for a game, and they were doing a play during game, and then the community vote was to liquidate right before the prototype was going to come out. That like nobody in the business world would ever do that. It was not a strategically sound decision, but I guess people, you know, it was a when prices were falling and people just wanted some liquidation. Um, so I think culture research, what it's shown is one way that you can think about how you want to best uh, maximize or, you know, use crowd wisdom is you should set your cultural values to match your customers' values, right? Well, how do you do that? Well, I think that's what you're doing here is that actually, you know, trying to match your contributor base and those who are coding and doing other stuff with who you actually think are the users of your product. And maybe they, the users are always the contributors, but I've definitely seen DAOs that I'm not sure that's actually the case. Um, could be one way that you could improve sort of the effectiveness of what you're soliciting crowd wisdom from. Another area that I think that's really potentially useful is, especially in this thinking about the long-term sustainability of a protocol would be where there's a gap between the crowd and the developer team as being largest, that's where you want to go and crowdsource. They were really always trying about closing these gaps. We wanted to be a smaller gap between um, users and developers. And ultimately, I mean, this is what I presented today. I I'm happy to take any more questions if you have them or just talk more about you know, what, I, what I've been discovering and thinking about. I'm sure I'd love to hear more about what you guys are thinking about too and stuff like that. Um, but thank you. Hmm. Excellent. Thank you so much. That was I definitely learned a lot, a lot of insights. Um, but yeah, I had one question. Um, well, a couple questions. Uh, so uh, in regards, you, you made the distinction early on between uh, the inclusive, uh, restrictive and secure uh, DAOs and organizations. Just curious, uh, have you been able to identify any um, like cultural trends that uh, tend to arise from any of these specific uh, types? Um, so I, so not, first of all, I have not seen many people. So I was originally when I was doing the white papers, one to pool what they claimed were their values or their missions. And I don't think as many DAOs think about values um, as I think organizations do in the sense that I pulled from firms' websites, you know, 93% of firms are putting out there what their values are. I was not exactly seeing this um, on the DAO space. And I think that just might be early days as they grow more. I would like to merge it. This is definitely in my thought process, but I haven't done it yet. Do you have any thoughts on it in particular way? Yeah, um, I, I think what you just said, um, I think makes makes sense with, uh, you know, as these DAOs grow, I think we'll get a better understanding of how, how, how some of these, um, you know, uh, cultures will like evolve and maybe we'll find like, uh, you know, a sort of, um, you know, essence of some of these um, different types, you know, uh, or trends. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, um, I mean, I, I think um, with, you know, just being things being like, uh, let's say, like more restrictive, I think um, those sort of cultures, um, you know, I, I think are maybe more geared toward us from the vision perspective, maybe they're trying to be more meritocratic. And then, you know, the ones that are more open, um, it seems to me that, you know, those are, you know, really big on, you know, uh, user involvement, coll uh, uh, community collaboration, that those, those sort of, you know, values seem to be natural, uh, naturally pegged to those sort of things. I, I don't know uh, if that makes you, what, what do you think? <laughs> no, I think that makes sense about, um, I actually haven't really thought through the um, inclusivity to be a, a more collaborative. I really think that a lot of them want to be collaborative, but as you're saying, maybe some of them don't. And so that could be part of it of how much can it be just run autonomously? Um, I think that'd be an interesting, but we put in a lot of the uh, business model fixed effects so you could think that maybe some of the DeFi protocols really want to be autonomous. Um, I don't know. It's interesting uh, to think about this and think about through the culture. Um, I would say one other thing that 
for whatever reason, what you made me just think about on the culture and forgetting that is just how, um, it was one of those silly things that happened during uh, the pandemic where trying to relate uh, via Zoom and all of that stuff and having taught on Zoom and all, all of these things. One of the things that that firm I showed you who was doing their dashboard and doing all these sort of tech things, they found that a simple thing of just using emoticons actually somehow just makes people more relatable. And I, I often forget this because I guess I came up in a world where it was much more formal than business communication when I was doing M&A. There was no way you're ever going to put a emoticon in anything. But Apparently that I actually much more relatable and happy and a way for people to empathize. And that is my one fear of being, you know, you see some of these DAOs doing it of having these in real life events, right? Um, so I do think that there's a, there has to be a way to get the empathy. And I know actually one of you, Daniel has written on trust, or I think I saw the little uh, diagram that I really liked uh, about how long it takes to get trust. And I think it's actually, a little bit sad that we're getting slower trust here because we don't have these events to bring us trust um, as fast. Yeah, hmm. super interesting. I'm, I'm I'm also thinking that perhaps related to the the lack of values in DAO's website is values is the thing that if you define too early, um, they mean nothing. Uh, like if you do it before there is like even a team formed and once the team is formed, you're in startup mode, there is a lot of pressure and so on. Uh, so people tend to hire, at least in like the startup world or companies, they tend to hire culture workshops or values workshops, either when there is a huge crisis and the organization is already big and you can attribute the problem to culture or otherwise when they have achieved a positive milestone, like they just fundraise or something and they want to revamp the mission before they kind of launch on their next uh, their next milestone kind of thing. And in DAOs, I'm thinking usually after you have fundraised or achieve a significant milestone, the community has grown and the cost of coordination is really, really high. Like one thing that I find DAOs extremely unable to do is to agree on copy uh, because it requires like extreme convergence, the moment that you need to agree on every word. And even a team of like three people can spend weeks arguing about the, the right word for a value, right? So, however, that doesn't mean that the culture is not necessarily being negotiated. Um, like a lot of these negotiation of culture can happen just through peer-to-peer -peer interactions, even if it's never formally codified. Um, so I'd be super, yeah, super curious to see whether with perhaps like some of the large language models and analyzing communication patterns, and especially what you were saying about well, yes, ideally we want the, the the values of the contributors to match that those of the customers and have some alignment in between like the inside and outside and so on. Um, we are collecting uh, data with one of the, the projects that we have, collecting a lot of data from Discord conversations and can run some of these analyses. Uh, so I'd, I'd love to know some of your, your thoughts uh, about this kind of like long thing I just said, um, but and the possibility that you see uh, maybe you could do something around that. I think so for sure. So I did not put it up. Um, sort of the way that I originally got into culture was doing, you know, a decade ago now, I think I did a re crowdsourced reviews to say, can we actually measure and quantify culture in a way that's coming from employees and not necessarily what's coming from the executive's mouths. And, you know, it, tend it tends to very much work if you're doing equity based stuff. I think one thing that you brought up and might be, so the events, that you were talking about and how that increases the coordination problem. I think that is a unique DAO attribute because while you might have typical events in a corporation, they're not gonna have these coordination challenges. I do wonder um, if DAOs may be different because of how decentralized they are, that you're gonna get more um, bottom up culture. I mean, overwhelmingly of the firms that I've worked with, it is top down. And I, I tend to believe top down works very well, um, but I think that that is perhaps is not aligned with DAOs. And so maybe the model, um, I almost put in some of the stuff about Henry Hansman's ownership of enterprise. Maybe the model is more of these flat orgs that have typically been consulting firms or typically been um, you know, networks of experts um, because they're so innovative, they've tended to be a lot more flat and not have that tone at the top coming down. Uh, it could potentially, um, I love that you want to do the large language models. I think uh, one of those, seeing what you see. But that being said, I've seen 
research studies on um, using the emails, right? So we had the emails from Enron, but I even know firms who've like given over their emails now for academics to analyze them. And I do think that there is just, I'm not sure if what I write in a chat room is necessarily reflective of values, but maybe it has to be in the DAO sense. Um, I think that's where it's hard. I do agree that you're learning peer to peer though. Um, I think everybody's always learning peer to peer regardless of setting. Yeah. But they're interesting questions and you should totally do it. I don't know, what DAOs are you collecting it from? You're gonna do the uh, research? Yeah, quite quite a few at the moment. I, I mean, Cello, Optimism, uh, about four DAOs in the near ecosystem, Ave, uh, and, and so on. Uh, we need to reactivate some of these because we changed the bot and so on. Uh, but we are trying to build Quite a significant database and then hopefully partner as well with academics who want to use the database and once anonymized but for research purposes um, there could be some interesting things we can do there let me change tact so a little bit uh, drea had um, a question in the chat she said i love to dig into the gaps we should you we should use crowdsourcing to narrow what kind of gaps are you thinking of um oh so the one where i was uh yeah, so exactly. Long term sustainability. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Andrea. Hi. Hello. So, thinking about this one, so I've noticed, um, I think maybe this was just really the one that I'd put up here about liquidating right before the prototype. And I think forgetting sometimes the needs of who might be your uh, community members. Um, and I think this is, you see how this actually happened in corporations where, you know, they give stock options and think that that's what people want when people really just want cash. So they can buy a house because they don't have any money. Um, and so thinking back through here, you might have very different um, incentives between the two groups. And so when I think the incentives are, are most misaligned, that actually might be the exact spot um, to work on. And I'm trying to think of other examples other than, I think if we went back to, because I have reading the through the different categories. Yeah, I was trying to think about the, um, I, I latched onto this because you talked about customers and align and using crowdsource, trying to count crowdsource the customer incentives and desires. And um, my background is as a, a customer researcher, a design researcher. Um, so at some level, that's like been my job. You know, companies pay me to go figure out what their customers want. Yeah. Um, and I I kind of love the idea of of killing that job by crowdsourcing it. Um, and it is fascinating to, I'm, I'm curious, I think we talk about DAOs as like the, the community uses the tool or the protocol or the thing, the product that is being built. And that's why they have the token. But it, you're right, it is much more likely to be sort of a quote investor. Um, and well, let's put it this way, there's a lot of non, um, there's a lot of, of protocols and tools out there where nobody's paying a service fee. The customer isn't saying, yes, I will give you money if you give me this thing that I want. Right? That that and that's usually the way that you align the investors and the shareholders with the customer needs is through that revenue stream. And so I'm a little I'm sort of curious about how uh, other models that you are seeing of, of using the crowdsourcing as an alternative mechanism for that. I mean, I think you're definitely seeing it with the retroactive pay and the like who gets awarded projects and how much they're doing that. Um, but then I wonder how much you're getting into groupthink too. Um, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of what we know from the multi-armed bandits and just thinking through that way is like, you really need that exploration phase and exploration isn't always necessarily a group thing, it could be a right. single individual. Um, and so, you know, I'm just looking through some of these ones too, reminding myself of, I mean, I actually, the investment ones were always the ones that were the most interesting to me. And actually even some of the treasury management stuff, um, we've been looking in a different paper um, at what people are doing. And I actually, maybe you guys have more experience in this. I guess I, I was, I was even myself personally shocked about how many gamblers or at least their actions when we look at their wallets, make it look like they're gamblers um, just based on the risk that their profiles that they're taking. 
Um, and so I think some of that might be where you're seeing it because not there's usually not the sense where you get to vote on, you know, what features do you want to add next or what should we prioritize um, as much as that you are seeing in DAOs, people really putting up like this is our next epic or like this is our next period. This is what we should prioritize, vote on which options you like or should who should we um, think to move to for like a celebrity uh, endorsement and some of that stuff um, seems very um, traditionally managed many. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. Yep. Yeah, I'm thinking we're, well, we have created these hyper like gigantic crowdsourcing tool which is the token voting that can do it in some extreme conditions of anonymity and so on um but we we haven't got the, the stakeholder distinctions like it's a very blunt tool as it currently stands uh so we're not different i mean part of the purpose precisely was to merge stakeholders into one with this fantasy that if everyone is a token holder then incentives are going to be aligned and the organization is going to work um, when in practice, we see that quite often ends up being is governed by gamblers uh, <laughs> or, or go, right, like govern, governed by airdrop hunters, um, as has happened to multiple protocols. And I guess we're not differentiating between them then at the moment of voting and so on, other than through apathy in that those who don't care that much don't vote. So I've thought about, I mean, I feel like that is where you might need I mean, nobody voted in equities until the Department of Labor basically forced all the pension funds to vote. Um, so we've had these problems before. Uh, and this is one thing I've thought about too. And I've heard some people are working on it, the revealed preferences argument. I mean, I'm a sort of, I know some people are too much on this, but I would love to see somebody experiment and see how bad it is if you actually are getting some of these. So there was reputation weighted based ones, right? But maybe not just reputation in that protocol, but really, you know, some Oracle can get data on me and knows my revealed preferences about what actions I take in life and can feed that data in to know what my, you know, preferences for voting would be. And so then it could be automated. And so you don't even actually need me. You just need me to take actions. And from my actions, you know who I am. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think that's that's inevitable to happen sooner rather than later, but but we're not there yet. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> not, not, not far, though. Like, I, I would be surprised if in three years from now it hasn't been built. Yeah. But yeah, it's kind of scary. Um, do you have any any thoughts around and and I guess your research is not necessarily covering it as it's not um included in well 150 well-known protocols. I mean, to my experience, there isn't a single DAO who's actually using this mechanism, but the idea of citizen assemblies who on one side can perhaps be very inclusive or include very much the community to participate at the core of governance, but on the other side is a subset, um, like a smaller group of members who are deliberating on it. And I don't know, given the, the research that you've done, if you will have any predictions around this or so where they are. I do think that there was, so I guess that's more the feasibility studies. I actually think they're a pretty good idea the way they end up, especially ones like, so what, ApeCoin does the feasibility studies, but I think that, you know, that one has actually gotten a relatively large consumer appeal, right? And so you end up having probably a way more variance in terms of crazy ideas. And so having an, an actual feasibility study seems to be, um, I, I'm not, I think that this was, you know, you saw it come up as significant in the results. I, I wouldn't be surprised if more people don't start going that way rather than having this, you know, you don't necessarily have to have this board-like feature, but I think the, um, I don't think you necessarily want developers to override everything. I think this is maybe this is probably wrong that you're going to outsource it then to a consulting firm or somebody like that. Um, and, you know, I, I have mixed feelings on outsourcing because in equity markets, I don't know if you know this, but most people outsource their votes. So what are we really doing if two people are vote, picking votes for the whole world? Um, yeah. Yeah. And so, but something like that. Um, and I know that what, because what's the other one that's been doing outsourcing a bunch of boat, votes? So I think delegation, I know somebody's working on a paper. I actually, somebody just sent one to me like a week ago on it. I'd love to see what people are coming up with um, and what they're finding initially on this delegation and how well it's going. Because I think one, one study I know somebody was looking at is that the universities are really, you know, sort of being thought leaders right now, but I don't think that the universities are going to, you know, presumably do that forever. Hmm. Interesting. 
Yeah, yeah, I've seen a, just anecdotally a trend towards student clubs becoming quite powerful delegates, like controlling very significant amount of assets in the space, which is fascinating. Interesting. Yeah. <sighs> right. I don't we're, know. <laughs> yeah, we're almost on time. I don't know if anyone has any burning question or anything that you cannot wait to ask. <laughs> now is the moment. All right. All right. Awesome. Right. Thank you, Daniel and Daniel. And I would love to, if you do get this data, I would love to know more about it. Uh, I know academics who would be super excited about that um, and looking at that. Yeah, ab no, absolutely. I mean, let's, I'll, I'll send you a message because we're actively collecting it. We discovered there was a, a, a bug in there. So we might have to throw away some data and, and recollect some of it, but is it's just the beginning of a bigger process. Like we're actually going to be rolling this out across as many communities as possible precisely to facilitate this sort of research on, on community health and better practices. So a collaboration there would be super exciting. I'll, yeah, I'll be reaching out. And anyway, thank you so much for the presentation. This was phenomenal. Like, uh, really love your research. And thank you very much, everyone as well for attending.